Today, we're gonna check in on the progress being made for both Starship SN3 and the SpaceX sites themselves down in South Texas. Then we'll go over how the world's current situation is or is not affecting SpaceX progress. We'll debrief the sixth Starlink launch that went down this week, we're up, share some positive Crew Dragon news, then finish with today's honorable mention. I'm k Dog. meow, and this is SpaceX in the News. The well-designed and constructed SN2 thrust puck that passed its cryo test a couple weeks ago has made its way back to the construction site to rejoin its Starship friends, or the body parts of its Starship friends that are now strewn across the land. Lately, most of the work has been observed going into the SpaceX facilities themselves rather than Starship, like pouring concrete foundations and a lot of plumbing installation. And they also began constructing what appears to be another high bay which is to be expected considering Elon has on multiple occasions emphasized the importance of assembling a Starship factory line rather than Starship itself. But that's not to say nothing is happening with the next Starship in the lineup, SN3. Workers have been hard at it, building the needed sections and stacking them in the high bay. Even Tesla batteries have made a reappearance as engineers installed them onto SN3. They were last seen being installed on the nose cone for the Mark I prototype, and they're expected to be used for powering the actuation of the vehicle's control surfaces. That means fins. Raphael is still keeping tabs on those individual SN3 body parts. And as you can see, it looks like we almost have a full Starship lying around. But this is what's currently stacked in the high bay as of this morning. He did have concerns about the number of rings this Starship will be made up of, to which Elon chimed in with some clarification. Quote, pretty close, design is evolving rapidly. Would be great to flatten the domes, embed the engines into it, and add another barrel and a half to the propellant portion of the hull which would fill in for the space gained due to the dome flattening and enable Starship to stay the same height, but increase its fuel capacity. Oh, and also the legs are a bit too small. Story of my life, I hate leg day. But Starship isn't the only vessel undergoing design changes, its super heavy booster is as well. Tim Dodd tweeted out a helpful comparison picture of Starship Super Heavy to other aerospace tech, and Elon responded that in fact, the booster has been increased in length by two meters and is now at an even 70. So 120 for the entire rocket since Starship is 50 meters tall. This extra ring or two for the booster will make it as long as an entire Falcon rocket. And with its 37 Raptor engines, that's 12 times as much thrust. But there's more than aesthetic changes coming to Starship. The spacecraft is also going to get a materials upgrade. Some parts will use 304L as it has a higher toughness at cryo temps. Then maybe by the end of the year, they'll move to an internally developed alloy. Maybe something similar to 30X or 30X that was used for Cybertruck. And as far as Raptor engines are concerned, lots of them are coming through the McGregor test facility in Texas, where they're firing them up in both horizontal and vertical configurations now. SpaceX renovated the old vertical firing stand on site so they could test their engines the way they were designed, flamey end down, as the everyday astronaut would say. But will the insane progress that SpaceX is making last you know, concerning the uh, microbiology situation at hand. We know from last Friday's internal emails that Elon sent to his workers that he wasn't particularly worried about it. So work continued on. Then on Wednesday, another email was sent to Tesla employees that until they receive a final word from the government, operations will continue with essential employees. But he urged those employees not feeling well or those reluctant to come into work to use paid time off and stay home. They are allowing those who have no PTO left to borrow up to 80 hours. And Elon again clarified that it was okay to stay home. Quote, I'd like to be super clear that if you feel the slightest bit ill or even uncomfortable, please do not feel obligated to work. I will personally be at work, but that's just me. Totally okay if you want to stay home for any reason. But again, that went out to Tesla, not SpaceX. And while we could assume that that same kind of sentiment goes out to all of Elon's employees, no matter the company, SpaceX does have defense contracts to fill. All right, but let's move on now and debrief this week's six Starlink launch. Originally scheduled to fly on Sunday, the rocket was literally less than a second away from liftoff when it stubbornly refused and shut down. As many of you know, the rocket takes control of its own systems at T minus one minute and spends that time analyzing thousands of pieces of telemetry data as it prepares for launch. It turned out that the auto abort was triggered due to out of family data during the engine power check, which translates to a faulty thrust sensor showing too much thrust was being produced. So thankfully, the rocket could more quickly be reset for a second attempt just a couple days later. And during the live stream, the SpaceX host informed us with new behind the scenes images of Starship's production. As expected, and despite the several job fairs they hosted, they are still looking for new hires to lend their hands in Boca. But anyway, back to Starlink, 
This time the launch was a great success, placing another 60 Starlink satellites in a low Earth orbit, where over the coming months they will individually raise their orbits using ion hall thrusters. Webcast host Jessica Anderson did fill us in on the current status of SpaceX's endeavor to reduce satellite reflectivity. One quick update, as many of you know, we've been running a number of tests to reduce the reflectivity of these Starlink satellites on their way to orbit. The first of these tests involve using paint to darken portions of the satellite. Preliminary results show a notable reduction, but we have a couple other ideas that we think could reduce the reflectivity even further. The most promising being a sunshade that would operate in the same way as a patio umbrella or a sun visor, but for the satellite. The sunshade option is slated for a future Starlink launch, and all of these efforts are ongoing and will continue to report results back as we receive them. Both reused fairing halves once again missed their mark with Miss Tree and Miss Chief and were quickly recovered from the water. But unfortunately for Miss Chief's fairing, it was recovered in two different pieces. A noteworthy aspect to this mission was the fact that the booster had already flown four times before, making this fifth flight one for the books, a record setter if you will. And whenever the envelope is pushed, it makes many SpaceX engineers a little on edge. As beneficial as failure can be, let's be honest, nobody likes experiencing it. And upon closer inspection of the booster's fifth ascent into space, you can kind of notice a sputter in the plume that occurred when one engine spontaneously quit before Miko, or main engine cutoff. This was confirmed to be the case by Elon on Twitter, and he said it didn't affect orbital insertion, though they will need to investigate before the next mission. Ultimately, the booster did what it had to do to get the job done at the cost of making the ultimate sacrifice. During its re-entry into the atmosphere, the booster oscillated a little bit before connection was lost. And that was the last time we saw of her before she made her bed with the fishies. Godspeed, booster. Again, Elon said that the previous scrub may be possibly, but not obviously, related to what happened with the booster's troubled engine. This vehicle had a lot of wear from its previous four flights, so it wasn't a big surprise. And to be clear, they wouldn't use a guinea pig booster for any customer missions. So congratulations and job well done, SpaceX crew. There's no doubt in my mind that eventually you will hit that magical 10th consecutive flight. As the SAS say, and the adopted motto of this channel, who dares wins. And there isn't a company out there who dares more than SpaceX. That's a Kevin guarantee. But some great news coming down the line from both NASA and SpaceX this week. They have opened up their media accreditation for Crew Dragon's Demo 2 flight. This first flight will place American astronauts into space upon American rockets from American soil since the space shuttle. I believe that's how the Bridenstein saying goes. And at this time, it's targeting the middle of May. Guys, do me a favor, all right? Everyone right now, snail mail NASA and ask them to let me in on this one. Let me in. Let me in. I have never seen a launch and I'm almost 20 years old, all right? That's downright un-American. I'm ashamed. But now it's time for today's honorable mention. As a lifelong fan of the early space race days, I thought it'd be nice to recognize a member of the Apollo program we lost this week. Alfred Merrill Warden was an Air Force fighter pilot and American astronaut who piloted the command module for Apollo 15, the fourth successful manned trip to the moon's surface, along with David Scott and James Irwin. During Al's time in orbit, while his companions were moonwalking below, he was recognized as the most isolated human being in Guinness World Records. And he loved his time in isolation. Warden was also the first to perform a deep space EVA, or extravehicular activity, during the return trip home to retrieve film cassettes from the service module. Al Warden died at the age of 88 of a stroke on March 18th, 2020 in Sugar Land, Texas. Godspeed, Al. There are only 13 astronauts still alive of those 32 who flew on Apollo, and only four of those 13 walked on the moon. So it's kind of sad to think about, you know, if we don't get back to the moon within the next decade, it's very possible that the world will once again be void of any living person who has ever walked on the moon. Something that hasn't been the case since, you know, the beginning of human history all the way up to 1969. But don't worry guys, we're gonna get it done. America. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you eccentric members and patrons who support the creation of this content. And don't forget we have our 100,000 subscriber live stream tomorrow afternoon. So come back and celebrate with the lawyer wife and I. And until that time, Godspeed.